Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, is a neurodevelopmental disorder which affects how an individual communicates and interacts with the world. Project Spectra was initiated by Grotra Club of Faculty of Science, University of Colombo, with the aim of raising awareness on ASD. As the second phase of our project, we have decided to conduct an interview series with a number of resource persons. As the more knowledge we have, the more we can raise awareness on autism within the community. So today we have with us an experienced clinician and an academic in the field of child development and child disability, Professor Saman Mali Sumanasena. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, ma'am. We warmly welcome you. So to start off, while doing the project, we had to be extra careful with our use of words as to avoid offending anyone on the spectrum or anyone who has experience regarding it. Something interesting that we found is the use of the terms special needs and differently abled in attempt of progressiveness. Is it in fact wrong to use the term disabled? Yeah, in, in, uh... In relevance to autism, I think um, the use, using the term disability, the term disabled is incorrect because uh, nobody is disabled. People can have a disability, but that does not mean they are disabled. So um, now, if we uh, think about um, the term disability, according to the latest uh, definition by the World Health Organization, the term disability uh, signifies a dynamic status. It is not a permanent status, not a static status. Because uh, when a person has a problem in the body structure or the function, because of the original health condition. So if you take autism spectrum disorder, it is known to have a problem in the brain structure, how the brain is wired. So because of this brain structure and the way that the brain is functioning, they have problems in certain activities. These activities are socially communicating, looking at somebody and smiling, uh, following our, following their social rules and norms. So these are the difficulties they can have. These we call activities. Because of this activity limitation, they can have a problem participating in the society. So that is where we call that there's a disability. So there's a disability in going for a party right so uh, we can use the term disability so therefore the terminology which is technically and correct from the human rights perspective is a child with a disability or a person with a disability we have we call it person first language. So the person is first, child is first, adult is first, the disability comes next, right? So if you consider other terms like special needs, children um, with different abilities, now those terms are technically not accepted because technically the accepted term is children with disability or persons with disability. But if somebody wants to use the word special needs or different they must they might be having their own perspective of the term disability. Because in some societies, especially in the Sri Lankan sector in Sinhala language, the term disability means abadita. Right? Abadita bhave. So the abadita suffix is there. So for people, those terms are very stigmatizing. 
so they know that but if you say special that means vishesha right so that gives a height to the word so therefore in certain contexts certain languages certain cultures people may embrace the words that they prefer right as long as that is the word preferred by that family or that particular child we must learn to respect but as um, as clinicians or as policy makers we have to use technically correct terms uh, also there is another lopsidedness is in the word disabled or disability in autism because if children are detected to have autism as young as um, less than 2 years there is a possibility we can work with them and get rid of all the disabilities that they have right so uh, therefore only few very subtle ones will remain so they will function within the society just as any typical human in such situations the term disability is entirely wrong to be used in autism yeah thank you so much ma'am for that clarification as you said person first language is the proper practice at the same time it would be best if we kept in mind that different people and families may embrace different terms according to their perspectives we know that early detection is the best way forward with asd what are these signs and when do they emerge first are there any special signs one should be extra attentive about yeah so uh, to understand that we need to know autism has two broad categories of features one is the going with the social communication and interaction the other one is going with the repetitive behavior so uh, the first social communication and interaction a baby will have is the baby will look at the mother's face and smile that happens as early as few weeks okay so little babies just as soon as they are born and they are put to the breast to suckle they will intentionally look at the mother's face if the mother takes the face close to the baby's face and start talking right so that is natural program that our brain is made up in children with autism this natural program is uh defective right so the problems begin as early as the point where the baby is put to suckle on the mother's breast and there will be issues with suckle right they will may not make that bond instantaneously as you expect in another kid so however majority of children who do not initiate breastfeeding who do not sustain breastfeeding who do not connect with the mother during breastfeeding are not identified as early as that point but that could be a point where clinicians and parents start being concerned and you don't give a diagnosis or a label of autism at that point but you start interacting with the child more intensively and try to get the child into towards that bond that we need to develop so you may come across kid babies new bonds who are very irritable who refuse to latch to the breast who refuse to uh, get soothed by human voice who are difficult to uh, handle who are always cranky who will not sleep in the night who will need a lot of sensory stimulation so in autism when you take the repetitive behavior component so social interaction is where they bond with the mother repetitive behavior component has lot of behavior that are driven through either absolute need for sensory stimulation or absolute aversion of sensory stimulation 
So if you take these sensory stimuli, they could be taste, they could be smell, they could be texture, they could be visuals, they could be auditory, they could be tactile, so they could be the need to rock, right? So these are some of the needs they might have or they might have an aversion towards. So little babies who don't suckle and who don't latch on the breast may be having an aversion to the smell, taste, texture, we don't know. Right? And then also some of these infants, newborn babies, and when they go into the like the first few months, they will need a lot of rocking, a lot of rocking to console them. They are non-consolable babies. Right? They continue to be crying. So these are some of the very early features that are uh, described in literature. Right, scientific literature. Then, if you look at the very common and something that we should all be aware of, it is the smile. The responsive smile. All babies, when you talk to them and when you do motheries, you know, the term motheries is where you talk to babies in a very specific very kind, like ha, baba, oh mother, like that, you know, we have a different rhythm and a tone when we talk to a baby, right? So, chuti patia, balana, that kind of language. Babies get used to that during the first eight weeks of life. By around six to eight weeks, babies, majority of babies start smiling. By three months, they should all smile very well with their familiar caregivers who talk to them while they talk. By four to six months, any infant will voluntarily smile with all people around them. They will smile with them spontaneously to get the attention of the adults. Human beings are such social animals. Right? So, if babies lack that initiation to socially interact, babies lack that responsibility to social interaction, that is the first point parents need to start by. Yeah? If you miss that, you have missed a lot. So, parents will if you ask them, are children smiling? They will say, yes, they're smiling in their sleep. Smiling in their sleep is not relevant to us. Okay, smiling in their sleep is because they dream. We are not talking about that. We are talking about responsive smile. In response to the mother's smile. Then they should start responsive cooing, making noises in response to the parents, right? And enjoying the company of other adults. They could be familiar ones or they could be non-familiar ones. Till nine months, babies warm up to anybody who comes and likes to talk to them. Right? After nine months, only they develop a stranger anxiety. So parents should become very, very aware about these very early features. Then we can pick up all this early and then we can act on. After about nine months, they should start babbling a lot, they should start interacting a lot, they should do a lot of responsive social games like if you do play peekaboo, they should do peekaboo with you, they should, if you point at something by nine months, they should start looking at it. For example, now if I show you this uh, pen and say this is a pen here, okay? first thing you will do is you look at the pen. And then you look at me, right? So when I say he or me, you will respond to me. That is the first response I'll give. The second response is you will look at the pen. And then third response is you look back at me. So that is called three-point joint attention, right? So that should be there in babies after nine months, right? So if you show this to a child in autism, they will only look at the pen. They will not regard the human being who is talking to them and showing it to them. Right? 
So it is very important that parents become aware how much this baby interact with you. So all I can have talked to you all about this, all this time is about interaction, starting from baby days. Then another big feature that will start appearing from about seven to nine months is these children will show very intense sensory behavior. Sensory behaviors may manifest in different ways. It could be motor repetition. So you will see that they all the time they are going to be repetitive motor movements in their hands. Through excitement, they will be overly moving their limbs, right? Excessive motor repetitive movement. Then other thing is aversion to foot. So when we introduce food at six months, many of these children tend to have an aversion to food because either they are overwhelmed by the taste, overwhelmed by the smell or the texture. Or they they have some aversion to this, right? So these are some of the very early features we will see even before the age of 12 months. But after 12 months, till 18 months, there may be a bit of a static period because some children may start walking and running around and all that. Parents will not give much attention to the uh, communication component or the behaviors, right? So after 18 months, then parents will start worrying again that the child is not talking, right? <clears throat> so these are the things that we will see uh, till about 18 months. Then after 18 months, you will see them <clears throat> repeating a lot of work that is called echolalia. So a lot of nursery rhymes, a lot of things that parents teach them. <clears throat> Like uh, words, so if you say pen, they will say pen. So parents will be very happy. My child is using the word pen. But it's actually not using the word pen, they are just repeating. If you ask them to go and read the pen, they might not know it. Or if you show it to them and ask what is this, they would not know it. But they would say what is this. That means they are repeating themselves. So this repetitive talk, and then they will not ask for anything. They will come and pull the parents by hand and then just go and show the um, just extended arm, something like that. They will be delayed to point. They will not, they will have problems smiling, looking at the face. These things emerge as the child is getting older. After 18 months only, you will see this. Then after 18 months, the next big group of features that we see is in play. If you look at them playing, they will not be playing with toys. They will be playing with toys in a very different manner. They will start lining up things, they will start stacking things, or they will be just doing the same thing repetitively. So if you have a cup and spoon, they will be just uh, stirring all the time, but they will not do multiple Steps. So that is the evolution of clinical features. Thank you so much for that elaboration, ma'am. It is vital that parents pay proper attention to the behavioral patterns during the development of their child. With that in mind, there is much debate and many myths surrounding ASD. According to your research and knowledge, is there any specific reason for this neurological developmental disorder? Okay, according to the available evidence in the world at the moment, uh, there is no specific cause or reason identified for right? The, with all the available evidence, what we can say at the moment is the only identifiable factor which is common to many children is possibly genetics, right? So there are some genetic material that are shared by families and that is why people identify this as one of the possible causes. So, for example, 
there are parents who would say that we are very uh, socially secluded parents. We don't like to go out. We don't have many friends. I was also delayed in language. So there is a very strong family. Then there is a child who comes and the child has very overt features of autism. So we think there is a link between that parent and this child. Then there's another child who is born, and that child is also showing features of language delay. But because the parents have already had one child with autism, they might work with that child, and that child may not have overt autism, right? So there is a definitive family lineage that we can identify. Based on that, the scientists and people who are learning a lot about autism think that there is a very prominent genetic factor, right? They have identified certain conditions, certain genetic combinations that can definitely have features of autism. That is another scientific finding. Other than that, there is no proven factor. But people have looked at things like environmental pollutants, they have looked at uh, certain food pollutants, they have looked at um, also certain factors such as birth injuries might pre-expose these genetics to be expressed in a higher way, higher prevalence. We don't know. So actually, there is no definitive factor. If you ask for me about myths in Sri Lanka, I haven't heard any specific myths about autism, but uh, language delay, they say boys talk late and all that. So that is possibly a myth. But, uh, so if you cut hair of a kid, they will be late to talk. These are certain myths, but Specifically for autism, I haven't heard any things with regard to uh, etiology or the causative factor. Thank you, ma'am. Like you said, there's a definitive contribution of genetics to this condition. So it's better if parents are more open-minded about these factors. Still, a lot of parents may be unaware that their child is with autism. Some may be in denial about it, even if they know that their child is different. What is the role that parents play in the lives of these children? For me, I think parents are the only people who will play a role in these children's lives. I think my role as a clinician is less than one percent when it comes to a child with autism, right? If a child with autism is fortunate enough to have parents who will understand this condition and who will understand how to address the needs of the child, I think that is the most fortunate thing that could happen to a child who is defined to have autism spectrum disorder, right? So if you ask me what is the role of parents in autism, I will say the entire role of autism is dependent on parents. Why I say so is from the, because I strongly believe any child with a developmental need will their, their rights will be violated if families don't seek time their attention. Right? If families decide to deny the child's problem, that is a violation of the child's rights. Because a baby, not a child, not an infant, can ever come asking for services. They are helpless. Right? But they have a condition that can be very uh, 
meaningful interest if we know, if we identify the man. Right? So, for example, as I was telling you, when a baby becomes very cranky, if parents don't seek advice on that, then there is a major issue. Right? I will come back to the negative point there, yeah, but let me first finish the role of the parents. So, uh, parents should become well aware about this is the one of the red uh, uh, red uh, messages I want to red color messages I want to you to give to the public. All parents in Sri Lanka should uh, take some initiative to learn about child development. The literacy about child development in Sri Lankan parents, extremely well educated parents, including sometimes doctors, is very, very low. It's less than 5%, I would say, from my mind. Yeah? Uh, they don't know when children smile. They don't know when children talk. They don't know how children talk. They don't know how children play. They don't know how children even walk. And then they walk, right? So, as parents or as responsible young adults, especially the youth of Sri Lanka, should take responsibility. If they are going to have a baby, they should become aware how they have to be responsive to the child's developmental needs. To become aware how a child will develop. There are a lot of websites for English speaking people. On child development, development with milestones, how to track the child's development, right? But in Sinhala, we don't have, in Tanya, we don't have, and I, I, I think as uh, policymakers, this is something that we should push the government health services to have easily, readily accessible to the uh, public. But if you take the child health development record, which is owned by all children born in Sri Lanka, that has the milestones listed. So there, we can't say it's not accessible to all public. Right? It is universally accessible. Parents need to take a look at it and check when they smile, when they talk, and then they need to seek help. Right? So identify, seeking help are two important things for parents. Number three is being available for children. And having developing interactions with children early. So we know autism is a, as I defined earlier, it is a problem how the brain is programmed. So in these children, the natural, because you know, brain is, you can have an analogy between the brain and the computer. So computer, if you put all the word PowerPoint, Excel, all those programs into the computer, the computer will function, right? So similarly, the brain is also programmed naturally according to our genetics when we are born, right? So we get certain programming programs from our parents and from nature, right? So we have got those as human beings, homo sapiens sapiens, we have these. So, autism brain will not have certain components in it. One is communication for social interaction and social uh, behaviors, right? And also they will have some abnormal programs in it, like a virus, that they will have a lot of abnormal behaviors, abnormal sensory responses, etc. Right? So, now it is the prime responsibility of parents to try to change it. Because in autism management, what we are doing is, we are, as external uh, people, we are trying to change how the baby's brain is wired. Right? So, if the baby is not smiling, we go near them, we will talk to them, we will do a lot of things to make them smile with us, to make them look at us. We will make noises, we might throw bubbles, we will do loads of things to interact with them. So that is the job of the parent. So that one here we are calling it 
responsive care group. So if the baby is smiling, we have to smile more and talk to them more. If the baby is not smiling, we have to pick it up early and try to go and smile with them. Play with them. If they are not playing with the toy. So if I give them the pen, they will start doing this. We will have to take the pen and show them, see Puta, you can draw with the pen. Right? So then they will learn how to use the pen. Right? If they take the car and turn it around and uh, spin the wheels. You can't take the car and hide it to prevent them from spinning the wheel. That is not the way to react. We have to take the car and show them, look here, we can push the car, right? And the car goes boom, boom, boom. So then the child will see, wow, this person is doing something which is attractive, which is nice. And the brain connections will change and then the child will learn. So from zero to three years, any child, whether they have autism or not, they are born in the program, just one program. Brain will start fitting in many more programs, right? By learning new skills. The brain has an amazing power to change, which is called neural plasticity. Right? Plasticity means the ability to stretch. Right? So there is an immense potential in the brain to learn new skills and develop new pathways. So if that is why we say pick up autism early. So if families spend time with them, sing songs with them, show them things, talk to them, give them experiences. So building on the experiences, the brain architecture will change. There is that potential. Being born as a human being, you have that inert potential to change the brain architecture, brain structure. And that can be done only at home, by parents, by playing with them, spending time with them, etc. If the mother decides to put a child in a cot and she sits down, and works on her laptop or works on the, in the kitchen or sits down and chats to the friends on the phone and totally neglects the child. If the father does not hold the child, hug the child, kiss the child, play with the child, throw a ball with the child, if the father decides to work from 8 in the morning till 10 in the night and come home late in the night, then there is no place for this child to learn. So, in addition to having autism, they will have a second burden of no uh, stimulation, no care, no responsibility by the parents. So, parents will either make it or break it in a child with autism. So, that is up to the point of diagnosis. But after diagnosis also, as a clinician, I of course request the families to take the lead in managing the child. We can show them how to do things, we can guide them, we can even sometimes teach certain skills to the parents. But if parents are not happy to go down on their knees, roll on the floor, play with the kids, sing to them, do all the silly things under the sun, being a child themselves again with their children, their children with autism will never equal. They might develop certain skills like learning the alphabet or singing a nursery rhyme or making numbers or reading letters, words, etc. Certain skills will develop. But the child as a whole will never equal. Right? So, fact, my advice to families is if you have a child with autism, you need to change first. The way that you interact with the child, you play with the child, you spend time with the child. Because the child is helpless. The child doesn't you know to ask for help. If you can change, the child can change. The change has to begin from the point of the day that you plan to have a kid not at the time of birth of a child. You need to change, you need to build new skills, right? You need to be prepared to be a good parent, a responsive parent, 
a parent who will identify the needs of the kid and be responsible. Right? Yeah. So parents, they, are it. they have to be there to learn and incorporate it into the child's daily life. Thank you so much, ma'am. As you said, parents are the main people who play a role in their lives. So identifying, seeking for help, and being there for these children are the prime responsibilities of the parents. If we talk about the education of these children, in many developed countries, there are integrated education systems where children with special needs are also included. But in developing countries such as ours, these children are discouraged from schooling and are excluded from the mainstream education. What is your take on this? And what kind of changes should be made in the education system in order to give these children the proper education they need? So about education, um, I, uh, I mean, we all know education is the gateway to the world. Right? If there is no education, there is no future for anybody. Right? Uh, but at the same time, we might have to revisit the definition of education. What is education? Right? So education is not all about reading and writing. Education is something much deeper. Education is learning new skills, understanding content, and acting appropriately. In a nutshell, I mean, it's not something that somebody had said, you are fine, but I'm just giving you a broader definition of what is education. So, um, First of all, when you say the rights of children for education, every child has the right for education. There is no discussion about it. But how, when, where, what to deliver has to be defined based on the needs of children. If you look at the child rights, uh, the the Convention on the Rights of Children it defines that as a child has the right to education. But uh, if you look at the Convention on uh, on the people of people with disabilities, also they say there's a right for education, but they have not said right for mainstream education. They have not said right for special education. They have not redefined it. So. Um, also, when we look at education, we have to look at the systems. Where are we are? What do we have in our system? Do we think it is optimal, the education system, not only for children, but also for any child in this country? So, there are a lot of debates that we can follow when it comes to education. But um, in brief, I would like to say. Uh, we have to consider our education system. If you look at the Sri Lankan education system, uh, our public education system is the predominant education system, which is accessible universally and which is accessible to the most people. We are not talking about Western provinces. We are talking about all provinces, including provinces like Uwa and um, the Wani, places like that as well. So the public education system, if you take, has many setbacks. They don't have resources. So if you take children with autism, you know they are in a spectrum. So the spectrum may be mild or spectrum may be severe. Now severe children, if you take children with autism with severe in the spectrum, they will, they might be nonverbal. They might not respond at all. They might be just talking to themselves or doing the same thing again and again, walking themselves, sitting at a corner, or they might be eating their own excreta, or like you know, it could be very, very severe and a very sad state for those children, right? So, children like that, we can't 
burning plants that they never used in the education system. Okay. Uh, then, if you look at children who are in the milder spectrum, they, I think, there is every possibility that we can incorporate them into the mainstream system. But even that is a problem because our teachers, our staff, don't know how to handle children with autism, even if they have mild symptoms. For example, a child who can talk, who can do the schoolwork, who can follow the instructions, but when they are working, they might sometimes do a little action like this. Right? Now, the teacher cannot tolerate that because the teacher doesn't know what is going on. Teacher might think, this child is mimicking me. This child is mocking me. Right? So they will get very upset in the classroom. Or else these children will continuously ask questions from the class teacher. Then they will have problems because the class teacher doesn't know to handle. In Sri Lankan education system, we don't have educational psychologists. We don't have occupational therapists. We don't have speech and language therapists. We don't have doctors who will routinely get involved with these children, right? So some of these children with autism will also have conditions like seizures, fits, epilepsy. They will be on drugs. They might feel sleepy. They won't have uh, suitable uh, resources to child for a child who is feeling sleepy in the classroom, right? So, yeah, with, with autism, there's an entire package of difficulties that will come which might not be able to be managed in a classroom either because we don't have resources or be, I mean, which may be human resources or other. They might not like the strong. So when the bell rings, the child will go like this and child will start screaming. When the teacher wears a red color sari, the child may have an aversion to red color. The child will go under the desk, right? And the teacher will try to pull him out and then child will throw a tantrum. So there are a lot of issues that children with autism will have. And there are a lot of things that we need to train our education system uh, to develop. Right? So it's a bi-directional thing. So this is where actually early intervention is vital. Because if we do early intervention, we can get rid of many of these established features of autism and we can easily change the child's behaviors within that early age period so that they can easily be incorporated into mainstream school with minimal distractions from the external parties. But at the same time, these child, children can have inner problems. It's not only, you know, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. So when the brain development is disordered, there may be problems. They might have problems writing. They might have problems understanding commands. So for such children, we need to have specific accommodations. So schools should be prepared for accommodations, which they are not at the moment. Some children who are nonverbal can work with the tap. They can tell, give their answers through the tab. The tab can answer for them. But the school should be able to uh, accommodate technology in the classroom. Families should have access to technology. So, there are a lot of challenges. It's not easy for me to answer the question and say, yes, they need to have, be in the mainstream classroom. Yes, they need to be in the mainstream classroom. I will. 100% advocate for that, but is our system ready? That is a huge question you need to pose to the policy makers. Is our society ready? Families have said that they will take schools to courts. They have done protests because there is a child with autism in the classroom. Families, communities need to change. They have said, uh, because there's a child who screams in my class, in this classroom, 
we are not going to send our children to this school. This child will kill my child, which is absurd. But it is our, it is the perspective of the community that we need to change. So when it comes to education, we need to change a lot. Because I strongly believe whatever I do for these children from baby days is not going to be raised if they don't get a proper education. Right? So the education needs to change. Education needs to be ready to accommodate these children with various needs. The society needs to be ready. Teachers need to be trained. More resources need to be given. So there's a huge change we are expecting. Thank you, ma'am. Moving on, a child with autism who socializes with other children may realize that he or she is different from others after reaching a certain age. What is the approach to be taken by parents to mentally prepare a child for this situation? Insight about you, about us. It's something, yeah, not very sure that some of the children with autism do have. I mean, insight is something that develops in human beings with age. It's a, it's a skill that develops with maturity. So, um, generally, if the child can understand things and if they can comprehend what we talk to them, we can make them understand and then we can gradually, so I mean this is where actually a clinical team can play a role, especially the clinical psychologist will have a role in talking to children uh, with any uh, kind of a disability to tell them like understand the beauty of them, first their strengths and then certain challenges they have and certain things that they might not have because I mean it's not only children with autism even we can have their own challenges every child will have a certain difficulty for example there are children who can't dance there are children who can't sing so there are things that we cannot do and uh, it's important that the families prepare these children uh, to manage social circumstances um, and uh, how to deal with it. That is what we need to direct them to learn. Uh, because uh, giving them that insight and giving them that self-confidence and the self-awareness, those are things that families can't do alone by themselves. They will need definitely clinical help. We we'll have to deliver the messages through different pathways to these children to understand that they, have, they might have challenges and they might have different needs. So uh, families need to start doing this from very early age. This is a very good question because even if we improve their communication, even if we, we improve their behaviors, so certain social skills may lack in these human beings. And then it becomes quite overwhelming for them. And what happens is they can develop features like anxiety, they can develop features like anger, right? So therefore we need to teach them to deal with this overwhelming social stimuli or social uh, demands, right? So. Sometimes avoidance may also be one of the strategies that we would ask them to do, right? Or uh, coping strategies, how they can manage within this situation. So it's very individualistic. We had to look at the child's needs. So we had one kid uh, who is brilliant, who is born for the math volunteer. He's learning in the mainstream classroom. But, uh, he has a strong aversion to uh, smell of certain food. Food. So these type of foods are very common in the classroom. So 
he gets very angry and agitated when he gets the smell of his food. And that is the factor why he can't socialize. So, you know, analyzing these situations and thinking what factor actually is the reason. It may be my voice, it may be the tone, it may be the noise, it may be a behavior, it may be the visual that they don't like, which will make them socially uh, overwhelming. Right? So, yeah, that, in that, parents need help from the physician. Thank you so much, ma'am. Different coping strategies can be taught to these children and parents may need the sound guidance of clinicians in order to prepare these children for the challenges that they may face someday. Furthermore, with the current pandemic situation, the lack of socializing is a challenge that many of us face. It may be a lot worse for individuals with physical and psychiatric disabilities, especially due to lack of access to healthcare. How can we address this issue? I think the service provider needs to uh, take steps and the policy makers and the clinicians need to come together and they will have to develop plans how to access these countries and uh, make them engaged. Uh, so at our institution, I can talk on behalf of our institution, we provide telehealth services. We provide uh, telehealth through video calls or even telephone calls. Um, we have helplines. So those are the ways that we have to work because this population is anyway at high risk for the COVID complications as well. So we don't want to expose them. But uh, giving them plans and asking them to carry them out at home. Uh, I mean, Sri Lanka being a low middle income country with uh, still adequate um, spaces available for families is a good thing because our families are not, the uh, majority of our families are not living in highly urban apartments or in shanties. So the majority of our population is based in spacious locations. So giving them opportunities to go outdoors and do outdoor activities and uh, trying to develop neighborhood communities, etc. Maybe some of the options. I think uh, if the pandemic continues, we have to look at more options at a national level. Thank you, ma'am. As you said, it would be better if access to telehealth services and helplines are improved for the benefit of these children. While we were doing research for the project, we came across a new term, virtual autism. Is this indeed a part of the spectrum? And is there any scientific background to this phenomenon? I, uh, to be honest, Hirani, uh, I don't think there's adequate evidence to support that claim because uh, as far as I know as a clinician who is worked in the field of autism, uh, relationship between screens and autism is slightly different. Uh, so, as I explained to you all at the beginning of this discussion, these uh, children have a tendency to get attached to repetitive stimuli. These repetitive stimuli could be visuals, could be auditory, could be tactile, could be uh, movement-based, uh, we call it vestibular, taste, smell. So if you see children with autism, you can you will see them either smelling all the time or putting their fingers in the mouth, just tasting. Sometimes touching certain toys, they will come to the clinic with soft toys. They will look at spinning wheels, right? They will like to rotate. 
so far wrong. These are all to do with their sensory. So if you give them a screen, which majority of parents do, because these children, they have two reasons. I tell you why it happens in Sri Lanka. The Sri Lanka, the vicious cycle begins at two points. Two points. One is when the baby is cranky and the baby is crying all the time as a little baby. Parents, uh, the, uh, the, the present day parents, tend to put uh, videos, especially nursery rhymes. They think that will calm the child. And they think they are not doing harm to the child because they are doing a nursery rhyme, which is educational. Right? So they put this, and what happens is because of their repetitive nature, their brain is so addictive. They will get addicted to that screen. Right. So, if they cry, the parents will the screen and then they continue to do that. You know, the, the brain is something that can easily be trained. So, they train the child to calm down with the screen. Now, if a parent does this by singing song, talking to the child, maybe a little bit of rocking, doing soothing things, there's always possibility for the brain to rewire. But by doing this, they take the opportunity of rewiring. They will strengthen that abnormal pathway of looking at the visual and the auditory stimulus, right? So, and then also because the child comes down, parents will totally go out of the picture. They will not try to give any verbal stimulations, any human contact to the child, but they will, the moment that the child cuts, put them in front of the screen. Okay? They will go to the extent of going and buy her up. Then, the second situation is, when the children don't eat, because I said, they will have aversion to test, taste, smell, and texture. So, they will have this natural aversion because they have autism genes. And, their brain is not programmed to eat normally as the other kids. So they will start crying daily feeding. What they will do is they'll put a screen in front of the child and then just put the food in the mouth. Right? These two situations will promote children to get addicted to screens. So if you ask whether the chick or the egg, I would say the chick. Right, because uh, the chick is the one, the child has autism from birth. The autism genes are there, but parents will promote them to watch screens and then make them more repetitive and establish the diagnosis of So it's not the fault of the parent, it is the fault of autism. But it is not virtual autism, it is autism. Right. Autism was always there, but we just brought it out. Right. So the moment, but how I am, why I am saying this is the moment you stop the screens, moment we start talking to kids, pushing them a little bit to eat, to console, to get comforted, they will learn those things. We have done it and we have shown, and that is not virtual autism, that is proper autism. Right. The other thing is, when children don't talk around one to one and a half years, they give these screens again to them with the hope that the child will learn the nursery plans, etc. So again, this is the autism dream that you are doing, and they will quickly absorb the nursery plan, and they will start singing the nursery plan. So I have children who are 12 years, 15 years, who come into my consultation. They come singing Jack and Jill, Jill went up the hill and how to down to and then twinkle, twinkle, little star, and then find little that sign. So they have a um, kaleidoscope of nursery lines in their mind. That's, but they won't know what is a duck. They don't know who is Jack. They don't know who is Humpty Dumpty. Nothing. 
no meaning, just work. But parents are very happy because the child is talking. What did they talk? Nonsense. Right? So this is not virtual laws. As far as evidence shows, there is no virtual laws. Autism is autism. But it's just that it is expressed better when you do stress. I mean, this is my understanding. This is not from evidence. There is no evidence to support. But, I mean, anybody can publish anything in this world and they can put it on the internet, in blogs, etc. So, I think this is an area, area we need to research more and find out. Yeah, that's my answer to the question. Thank you for that clarification, ma'am. Finally, is there anything that you would like to share with us in addition to the areas we discussed? Uh, I have just one more to add, if you don't mind adding it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, wrong methods of intervention going on in Sri Lanka. If you uh, can add one, one little bit to my uh, like what my discussion was like to that if you can uh, like say like that there are a lot of wrong methods like you know uh, starting from acupuncture right and certain uh, medicines uh, certain methods like stem cell transplantation, those are wrong methods because autism is all to do with interaction and changing the brain structure. And also there are methods like, you know, massaging, applying things. Uh, these are also all wrong methods. So maybe we need to add that to the discussion as well that parents should not be following these wrong methods. That is also something we have to but all in all, if you are asking what needs to be done, as an additional thing, I would say building awareness about autism in the community so that we can easily get these children to go to schools and all that. That is something. Uh, then um, building awareness about early child development and parenting. These are the three things that need to be done. Yeah. With that, we hope that we were able to raise more awareness on autism through this interview. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining with us today, for giving us your valuable time amongst all the work. It was an immense pleasure and an honor to have had this discussion with you. And for our viewers, we hope to see you in the future with yet another phase of Spectra.